Hello, sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. We will be back again next week with some more State of the Union, but what we thought we would do for this episode is we pre-taped an interview with one of the great and most colorful characters out there in soccer, Thomas Rongen. Uh, You would know him from his television work. Uh, He has been a coach over the years in multiple different leagues, international coach, club coach, uh, played back in the NASL. He is just a legend when it comes to uh, American soccer and the stories that he has and the way that he thinks about the game. We wanted to get somebody on with, like I said, a colorful personality. Uh, He's crazy at times. Uh, but I, I think he's a wonderful guest to have on a show like this. So without further ado, let's talk to Thomas Rongen. All right. As promised, Thomas Rongen joins us here on the State of the Union podcast. My uh, my good friend, my former coach. I, I got to say, a U.S. soccer legend for everything that he has done on and off the field. And if you ever get a chance to sit down for any length of time with Thomas Rongen, you will be better for it. He is one of the most interesting people out there, uh, one of the most uh, learned when it comes to especially soccer and American soccer on and off the field, and just a really, really nice guy. Thomas, when we thought about doing this show uh, right around the Christmas time, right around the holiday period, I wanted somebody like you because you have such a breadth of experience when it comes to soccer. But also, when we're at home for the holidays, oftentimes, as you know, family, we love them, but they can drive us crazy. You want to get out there. You want to do some different things. Hey, I don't know. Maybe you want to go to a movie. Well, Thomas Rongen has got you covered here. New movie is out now in theaters. You can find it all over the place. Next goal wins uh, out this year. Like I said, Michael Fassbender playing the great Thomas Rongen. So first off, in general, I know you've done a lot of press. I'm sure you've been asked this question and other questions time and time again. How does it feel, my friend, to be on uh, on the big screen, as it were. I do some pretty badass, surreal moment. Like, we all sit around one point in time and just, who would play me in a movie? It never will happen. Well, in my case, Spike or Ethan Fassbender or Magneto or Inglorious Bassus or uh, who was the guy from Apple? He got nominated for an Oscar when he played to the. Mr. Jobs uh, so well. And, and and the interesting thing, Lex, I spoke to him yesterday actually for a long time about a lot of things, including his racing, which he which he loves. So by the way, he does a pretty good Thomas Rung, I, I, I must say. <laughs> um, you know, it was really refreshing to talk to a, a, a guy that actually apologized and said, I, I didn't do you a lot of justice because obviously what did he change a lot of things in the movie, but it's been one hell of a ride, and in particular because uh, the the strike. So I did all the heavy lifting, you know, in terms of when it came to Fassbender, uh, Berlin, uh, LA, uh, Toronto, with what TT Till about a week ago, uh, the Hollywood stars were able to do the red carpet and the interviews again. But you're right; it's been a <laughs> it's been it's been fun. <laughs> Uh, Thomas, uh, there's a lot of debate right now about Hollywood taking dramatic license with movies. And I know with Next Goal Wednesday, they'd play a little loose with the facts at times. So how odd is it to see a movie ostensibly about your life and you're seeing things that you're thinking, I never said that or that didn't happen that way? Yeah, th- th- I'm telling you, that was a tough moment for me when I saw the movie first about two months ago, all alone in a big ass theater. And after two minutes, my head is spinning. Because the start is I get fired. Uh, and, and part of the firing squad is my wife, who has a relationship with the president of American Samoa. Well, I was still happily married. So that like spun me around. Then Fassbender uh, is an alcoholic. Yeah, I like a bevy, but uh, <laughs> knows, if, if they turn him into a chain smoker, fair <laughs> enough. I'm. I'm not emotionally intelligent. I become emotionally intelligent due to these beautiful people from Polynesia, but I, I have social intelligence. And the Dutchies, we, especially the downtown, the red light district where I come from, we embrace anybody. Well, Fassbender doesn't embrace a transgender, doesn't embrace religion, uh, doesn't deal well with uh, church and death, which are all interesting subjects that Taiki Watiti tackled but changed completely throughout the movie. So it took me three times to 
to get a better appreciation for what he was trying to do. And he says, I'm going back to my roots. Yeah, that's uh, Tiff, Toronto International Film Festival. Uh, I want to go back to my roots. He's he's from New Zealand, but from a tribe. There's Jaya in the middle of years later, first transgender to ever play in a World Cup qualifying game. And I took some, you know, some liberties. You know, I had to change certain things because otherwise people might as well watch the documentary. So after it's all said and done, I, I, I get now the, the humor, which is different. The Polynesian, the Australian humor, in particular, the tribal humor, which Watiti is from the Maori tribe, um, I, I now get it. And, and I, I can smile, although initially it was a little bit like, uh, people are going to walk out of this movie, or at least after an hour ago, this is Thomas wrong is a real... <laughs> Well, you should be used to that. I mean, I know me and many others over the years have said that, have said that about you with love, with love. <laughs> hey, 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 listen. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the 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 you know the true story, which is just as amazing as as anything that Holly is going Hollywood is going to come up with. And you mentioned the documentary in 2014. For, and for those that don't don't know the story, I'm not giving anything away here. But Thomas Rangan finds himself coaching American Samoa, American Samoa ranked at the bottom of the rankings. Uh, just you know, a, a history of failure and tries to qualify them for the 2024 or so the uh, sorry to the uh, 2014 uh world cup and everything that happens on and off the field can you take our, our our watchers and listeners through as to how did you find yourself even in that position is there a uh a, is there an agent involved are you just working the phones do you walk in through the airport or something like that how no. do you get over there I, I i was coaching the i was going into my uh fourth cycle with the under 20s that go on to the world cup in 203 207 209 and at the end of 2010 when i still was the under 20 coach as you know like uh, as coaches of national teams even youth national teams you get your players for x amount of weeks uh throughout the year to prep uh, friendlies qualify and hopefully get to the world cup so i had some downtime and sunil galati called me uh late 2010 and said we have a territory called American Samoa, who's looking for some technical help. And I remember, I said to Gail, and let you know Gail, although unfortunately not married with Gail, you know, I go, where's American Samoa? She goes, it's next to Fiji. So without knowing anything, I go, yeah, I made it, Sunil. No problem, send me the details. Put the phone down, Google it. They're last in the FIFA ratings, and not one in 20 years, and not scored a goal in 20 years. Uh, and lost 31 to nothing against Australia, which is the worst ever qualifying defeat in the history uh, of, of, of the game. So that was the next day. But I, I love to travel. I love challenges. It was just a unique opportunity to, to see if I could make a difference maybe on this beautiful island with these incredible people. Uh, you mentioned that 31 to nothing. France recently beat Gibraltar 14 nil in a Euro qualifier, and that reignited this debate about these minnows taking part in qualifying. Some people think, what's the point? While others say these teams are only going to get better if they get to play against better competition. You have such a unique perspective on that, having coached American Samoa. Where do you come down on that debate? Yeah, that, that's an interesting one, because I've I, I been make very valid points shown for, for both of you. And, and I think one of the reasons why we're seeing you know, in quite a few leagues all over every confederation, coming up the Confederations Cup, you know, which is the groups, and at least you get minnows uh, to play against each other and can advance eventually and then measure themselves against better teams. Unfortunately, and I think the World Cup in 2026 will show that, that there will be quite a few games that might be very, very lopsided uh, against the second team from Oceania. Again, let's be real honest, the fifth, sixth, seventh teams of, of, of CONCACAF. Uh, and we might see maybe not 10-0 plus with lopsided games that you walk away with and say, who benefited there the most? Uh, certainly not the team that scored eight, and certainly not the team that, that uh, gave up eight. But I think at the end of the day, there are more positives, in my opinion, than negatives. And what better way to showcase so these not only beautiful countries that are trying to get to the top, but have some incredible stories that come with it as well. If American Samoa 
would make it. Everybody would understand how beautiful that island is and, and, and what the Polynesian people are all about, although they probably won't. But, you know, it's it's got some interesting things. I look at Lex, you know, I mean, when you introduce a team that's never been to the World Cup, I think there'll be some great stories that people can latch on to. And hopefully in, in time, some of those minnows don't get hammered at 14 to nothing anymore. Well, let's, let's turn a little bit to American soccer and in particular the U.S. men's national team and how far it's come. And, you, you know, you mentioned your work with the Federation. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think we owe a, a debt of gratitude to Thomas Rungan for kind of being on the forefront when it comes to identifying uh, and I guess courting dual nationals. We talk so much about dual nationals now when it's uh, when it comes to this national team. It's a real part actually of, in this case, Greg Berhalter and his staff's job is to go out to recruit and, you know, just, I guess to sit on couches and do all that kind of stuff. But back in the day, uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were already thinking about this and already, comp, uh, you know, uh, putting together types of lists and identifying players here. So uh, take us through why you saw that kind of coming around the corner and where it has progressed to to today it, it first started with uh with with close it you know close it uh chose uh, to play for uh, uh sorry it was west germany or did he go to the, the, the uh, i i i can't remember but at that time there were three or four pretty big names that had dual Citizenships, and these were big countries: Spain, I think, Brazil, and and, and Germany was the ball. And, and in our conversation with the technical staff, which would then start with either be Bruce Arena, uh, Bob Bradley of Europe, Clinton, those were the three head coaches uh, that I worked under. Well, you can take the '98 World Cup where I was the assistant coach with with Steve Sampson as well. I said to Sunil, uh, "We might want to look at that," and and there was a great reluctance. Uh, by U.S. soccer, Dan Flynn, uh, 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 Sunil, and even some of the head coaches uh, that felt that that would be a very fine line. How do we do that? Uh, <laughs> how do we go into Mexico and try to, you know, tell the Mexican Federation we're going to do the following? How does Bayern Munich go respond to the fact that we want to see a green in a U.S. match national team jersey while he was playing for the German national team? So I, I kept pushing the envelope. Um, and ended up with 400 plus players within a four year span. And of those was a joint 16, Jonathan Brooks. When I first uh, saw him uh, with Jerome Kisewetter, Walter Boyd, Walt Boyd were at Victor Berlin uh, in 2007, 2008, and all the way to Boyd, who was already at that time old enough to play for the senior national team. And I would give that information to the respect to Echo just and let them make decisions. And from the 400, I'd narrowed it down myself based on video analysis or based on the fact that I traveled to those places uh, for several reasons. One, to see them in training. Two, in practice, but more so, were they really dedicated to play for this country? That was a double-edged sword. And I'll tell you, if I look back at it now, Sean Alex, I might have been the one that created a, a huge rift that eventually came uh, to pass uh, after the Mexico game in Columbus when Klinsman and one day changed the system and Bradley uh, and Jones are going crazy and all of a sudden losing Costa Rica and then the division between German Americans and true Americans. And I'm a great advocate of player development, American player development. I feel firm about that. If I look back at it, I might have gone a little bit differently, quite frankly, because I think we ended up with a play few players that were more mercenaries uh, than that they cared about the press likes. And, and you know, I want to somewhat apologize uh, for that. Although uh, one great example that people I think misinterpret is that John Brooks, who is an introvert, but cares very much about this country, has gotten somewhat of a bad rap. Uh, there were two or three other guys that I, I, I knew very quickly, uh, basically said I had a much better chance to go to the World Cup with the U.S., with the German national team for instance. Well, that, that makes it much easier for us to be able to blame you then. If that's what you'd like, no problem. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I'll take it. No, yeah, absolutely. All right, Masi. Uh, Thomas, a lot of people think this current generation of U.S. players is clearly better than anything that came before it. But Josie Altador, a guy you coached at the under-20 level, 
he stirred some controversy recently. He said the 2014 U.S. team would beat this current team. So where do you come down on that? Do you think the player development has gone to a different level and these guys are better now? Or some of those past U.S. teams deserve more respect? Yeah, I, I, I do. And if you just took from a results standpoint, you might even say our 202 run, that that if it's not for Torsten Frings or whoever, the German, the handball, we're in the final four, guys. You know, that's the, the, the Korea-Japan one as well. And if you take that starting 11 uh, on any given day, I, I would think that that team would still, yes, okay, Tony Science is your right fullback. Young Leonard Donovan, the Barkers Beasley, Conway, Private Bright, uh, played Reagan on the right, you know, that gets that great assist against uh, against Mexico. Kobe Jones, you know, the, in, in the back with had some experience as well. Uh, I think O'Brien was part of that, uh, part of that one of the few Americans that, that time he played in a fairly high level, you know, at, at Ajax. But I even argue to say that that team on any given day could give this team uh, a chance now from afar the experiences uh, that these guys are getting right now like, let's say i'm wearing this milan jersey because i did something for cbs winners and losers this morning uh, of the champions league and you know, i picked Pulisic as a as a winner here you see back in the game at one one second the goal score after jury uh, the sequence starts with uh, with musa Another American, uh, and all of a sudden, if uh, if if you know if Timmy Weah gets healthy, you got four guys that start pretty much for some of the biggest teams in in the world, and you know we're making some great strikes in in the EPL as well. Do we have a player of Manchester City, Bayern Munich, Real Madrid uh, caliber yet? If we you know, do, we need a superstar to break that mold. Uh, on paper, this current team. Yes, it has the most potential, uh, but, you know, the great thing for Greg Berhalter is that we'll find out pretty soon through Copa America where this team is at and can they in the size of big games against a team potentially on paper a little bit better. Uh, can we win those games? Because that's what it's all about. We didn't do it against the, the Netherlands. Uh, we got pretty much done by a German team very similar to what the Netherlands did in, in the World Cup to us as well. Then I go, what strides have we made? What kind of impact can Bert Berhalter uh, put on this team when he gets him in for three days prior to a, a match? Uh, that's hard. But I still firmly believe that in 26, this team at home could go to the round of eight or final four if they continue their maturity individually with their big clubs in Europe right now, so they get great experiences, uh, play on the pressure, and if we continue to become better uh, as a team, and that's where Berhalter is going to make some tough decisions in terms of his playing style, philosophy, and, 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 and even still filling in one or two huge positions, including the number 10 position, the second center back, and, and, and who's your number six right now, if Adam still is, is out. All right. Well, Masi, what I hear Thomas Rangan saying is that Josie Altidore is full of shit. So that's uh, that's the headline with we, what we're going with uh, forward. Th- uh, listen, Thomas, um, I-, I asked this of people, and we're going to let you go, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, we could talk for hours and hours and hours. Um, I asked this of people because you have been around American soccer and been around this this incredible community, and we're celebrating, and hopefully everybody's out there with their family and with their friends and celebrating everything on and off the field that we are as a country and that we are as a soccer-playing nation. And like you said, you've seen this evolution. What is one thing, or you can give me a couple of things if you want, but one thing that is great about American soccer and one thing that is not great about American soccer. I get it. I get it. Next goal wins. Don't worry. We're going to give you plenty of love. Exactly. In Don't you games, worry. In tight games, in tight games, that's it. Next goal wins. So we haven't done that frequently against the better teams in the world, both in friendlies, but more so in uh, in, in huge games. You know, struggled throughout qualifying a little bit. If Epi doesn't bail us out, that's another thing. Epi versus uh, Bollinger. It was your perfect number nine based on 
you know, your playing style and 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 philosophy. You can hardly say that Ricardo Pepe scored the most important goal in Champions League history for the America getting PSV Eindhoven in the round of uh, sixteen. Um, Lex, I, 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 I'm a big. And this is going to, I'm a big regular of the Fed. I'll be real honest. With you. I'm a big fan of American coaches and American players in terms of of, of development. I think that Rick Berhalter uh, can take his team uh, to the to the next level, uh, although he's not proven that yet. But when I talked to him, particularly when Gordy Stewart was there, uh, you know, we wrapped a little Dutch because Greg obviously played in 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 the Netherlands, and I firmly believe that what they put together uh, made a lot of sense to me in terms of their journey, uh, which clearly was the end 2026. And now I'm talking about just when Greg Barolo was hired by Ernie Stewart in the early stages. And I think we're, we're, on, a, we're on the right trajectory. Uh, let, let's, let, let's put it that way. Uh, Thomas, uh, Lionel Messi came to MLS uh, this year. It was so interesting to see the Inter-Miami players adapt to playing with Messi. There are only a handful of players in the history of the game that have a comparable genius to Messi. You played with one of them, Johan Cruyff, with the Aztecs back in the day. What's it like to play alongside somebody like that and try to be on his wavelength? Uh, it, it's it's unbelievable. I mean, it really is. And, and some of the greatest players, and after that list, uh, Bert Mueller was my roommate in Florida. Bert Mueller at that time was the leading goal scorer of, at, at the World Cup and still holds the record at Bayern Munich, obviously, as the best number nine killed us in 74. Uh, we went to four World Cups of Dutchies. We're bridesmaids. We're too romantic. Uh, we can't score the next goal and just say, let's close shop. But that, those guys, A, make other players around them better. That's that's one of the great qualities of the greatest in the world. A look at Robert Taylor, for instance. Even Joseph Martinez and others that benefited uh, from... Troy or, or, or Messi. They're incredibly, although both somewhat introverted, incredibly competitive. I mean, you look at you look at Michael Jordan tape, and although Messi has changed, let's be real honest, that a change came somehow in the last World Cup, and he's continued that in qualifying when he gets third face to face in MLS as well. So there's a chip on his shoulder, and all of a sudden from introvert, he's become more extroverted on the pitch because I think he knew that his team Argentina uh, needed that. So the emotional intelligence combined with some instinctual stuff, I would ask Troy why? And he couldn't explain it to me. Uh, whereas at this day and age, because we didn't have data analysis, there was no XGs, there was no passive patterns, there was no uh, whatever, which I think players right now rely on and get a much better understanding if I talk to Mbappe after a game, um, he can explain actually why he did certain things. You know, literally right after the game, yeah, I wanted to come inside, draw people in. The nutmeg was on. I sort of passed, but I also knew that both people were shielded. I, I didn't hear that from the Mueller's and, and the Croys um, because they really said, "I don't know." Instinctually, that's just you know. What I what I what I do, uh, so it's interesting too how the game has evolved on the in and the outside. But calling Messi's games right now and see a great teammate, great leader, uh, more so on the field, uh, quiet still off the field, uh, and done for a reason, obviously, uh, because they're really trying and they are enjoying. I think their American experience. One of the things I took away. From all those great internationals, the biggest players in the world, from Pele to Poi to Bert Mueller, is that they talk in their books or later when I talk to them, the most enjoyable experience was playing in the United States. Was it one, two, or three years for the mere fact that they were somewhat of an unknown and were able to live their lives much freer and better? We all know education. We all know the lifestyle. I think there will be more Messi's coming this way after Messi. But you're right, Sean. Uh, in incredible uh, how these guys can carry teams and make a Robert Taylor from a $100,000 player into a $5 million transfer guy because he benefited and understood, just like Steve Ralston did in his rookie year after a week 
He came up to me and said, he said, all this played into Proros of Alderama, and you know he's going to open up, I know he's going to be such a good shielder, and then he's going to play the ball between inside, left, uh, center back, and left back. And with my speed, if I time it right, I can get there. And that's what Steve Ralston did, rookie of the year. That's how Roy Lasker scored almost 30 goals, benefiting from Valderrama and Stevie Ralston as well. Certain players get it, some don't. Um, but most people, as I said, and uh, certainly uh, will become better with such great icons playing next to them. Arguably the best player in the world, or it's still a debate, Maradona, Messi, uh, Pele, whatever. One of the great minds in American soccer, as far as I'm concerned, and an even better person, Thomas Rongan. Thank you so much. You can see his life, albeit with a little Hollywood magic dust sprinkled in there, uh, in uh, Next Goal Wins. It is out right now. Thomas, uh, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. My best to you and to all of yours over there. I hope to see you at some point along the way, my friend. Uh, you're, you continue to do amazing, amazing things, and we are so blessed to have you as part of the Amer American soccer community. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for, for having me, me guys. And as, as Taiki Waititi said, because this is a feel-good movie, trying times in the world, be happy and slow the f*** down. <laughs> Words to live by. There we go, my friends. You heard it right from Thomas Rongan. Hashtag it. Make T-shirts. Do whatever, do whatever you need to do. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Masi, that was uh, interesting and fun. I told you, he's a character. Phenomenal. <laughs> Can't wait to see this movie. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Such great, great stories. I remember, uh, I'll tell you a real quick Thomas Rongan story. I remember, I think I've told you this before. He fined me. Like, Thomas Rongan fining you is the ultimate, <laughs> you know, that caught the kettle black, right? I mean, it's, it, 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 so I came home, I, I got in late uh, after a night out when he was the coach, and he fined me on the spot $100 and made me pull out $100, which I did, and I, Gave him a hundred dollars. That's back when we, we carried uh, cash. But as I said in the uh, in the intro to him, if you do get a chance to sit down with him, just just do it because he has incredible stories, incredible context, and I think he showed he thinks about the game on and off the field in sometimes a very very different way, but oftentimes in a way where he is seeing things uh, ahead of time. Listen. I hope everybody is having a good break. I hope everybody is having a uh, wonderful holiday season. As I said, I hope everybody's with family and friends, and we are thinking back on what 2023 was, the good and, you know, certainly some bad along the way, but also forward onto what 2024 is going to be or can be, hopefully. Uh, and uh, here's to a great 2024. We'll be back again, like I said, later on, uh, or uh, excuse me, next week with some more, uh, more shows. Mossy and I are traveling, going all over the place, but we're still bringing you State of the Union. And that's what we try to do. We try to be consistent. We try to live up to the routine that I know a lot of you uh, follow when it comes to your podcast listening. We don't want you to go to that, that machine click it and not have it be there. So don't worry. We will we will feed the State of the, the Union podcast beast that is out there. Mossy, anything before we go? Happy New Year to all the listeners and to everybody who works on the podcast here at Fox. Absolutely. And as the saying goes, size the day. <laughs>